Hello. Hello. Hey, Olivier. So is this your first call? Uh, do you want to be associated with some company? I'm uh, from Oracle. I'm just looking into this. It's really interesting. Uh, do, you mean, do you know if Ricardo wants to join today? No, I don't know. I'll go ping him right now, see if he's available. Yeah. Okay, uh, since the good. channel switched to password authentication, maybe we give people a little bit more time. Yeah, I think also last time it took them about 10 minutes for everybody to get on board. Hello, Jiangming. Is this your first call on serverless workflow? Yes, yes, yeah. So uh, I was going to join with a few of my teammates, uh, Jorgen and Olive. So yeah, um, I would like. To okay, so yeah. I get it here from Oracle as well. Then, yeah. Jorgen Johnson. Hi. Just out of curiosity, are you also with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure as K is, or are you from a different department? Yeah, so we are from Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and, and by the way, it's uh, X. It's uh, like Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no response from Ricardo yet, but I'll let you know if he says anything. Hey, there's K. Hi, K. Okay, and it's almost five minutes, so let's start. Um, community question time. Does anybody have a question? Note, then let's get to our first agenda point. We have a new logo. Um, after the CNCF design team has proposed us with uh, uh, several options, and we had a coloring discussion last meeting two weeks ago, uh, we finally come on the Slack channel to this logo. That is our new project logo. And uh, if I understand correctly, we are waiting for the, the artwork team to come up with the different formats uh, to upload it in the, do they upload it to the landscape or would they deliver it to us, Tiermia? Uh, I think we will get a link uh, where we will get this logo with text, without text, uh, black and white, white only, I mean, all kinds of different options. So then we can pick and choose, but where the link is, I'm on it. I was just told uh, artwork repo. So where that is, I don't know yet. Yeah. Sorry. I'm new to this as well. Okay, 
and we have a few spec updates. Um, Timir, do you want to say something about the, the updates yeah, to the uh, subflow state spec? Yeah, definitely. In the last two weeks, we've had a couple of um, updates. Uh, the biggest one is the one I hope we will discuss today. Uh, and I have a little presentation for it as well, so we can all kind of look into it. But these updates that are mentioned there is we updated the uh, subflow states uh, specification uh, document because uh, via community also, um, uh, it wasn't very clear as far as how function in event definitions uh, get propagated to uh, subflow states. Again, for, for people their new subflow state is a state that allows you to, um, rather than have it uh, allows you to have reusable workflows uh, that can be used in, in several other workflows. Uh, they solve a particular business solution. Um, so uh, a sub a subflow state allows you to point to one and that gets embedded and gets executed at that point during the workflow execution. Um, so uh, there was a question, okay, the subflow state inherit function event definition. So there was an ongoing discussion that in the PRs. And at the end, we decided that no, uh, each uh, subflow state has to define its own uh, function and events. So services that he wants to invoke um, and uh, the events that he needs to be either consumed or produced uh, during its own um, execution. So that was mainly the decision because we are as a specification base, we do not wish to allow runtimes, not that we don't wish to, but it is better for runtimes for us to be very clear and specific what we want. And also at the same time, each workflow, regardless if it is a subflow or a parent flow should be able to be validated on its own rather than depending on uh, another workflow's definition. So we decided on that. The second one is, um, kind of goes in line with this uh, because we uh, now force that each workflow defines its own functions in the definition there's all definitely cases where we want to reuse those um, and so we allow now for functions not all, only to be referenced in line and events but also uh, to reference an existing json or yaml file which include uh, those so basically you can uh, define a json or yaml file which includes your function definitions or your event definitions and you can reference them in, in, in your function, in your workflow, and that should be embedded. Uh, so multiple workflows uh, can reuse them rather than having to, to, to inline them in every single workflow definition that you have. Uh, so that, that was an update. Um, so the third one is the one that we're gonna actually talk about today. It's just a PR form currently, but I, I, that's something that we all really need to decide. And I'm just trying to make a case for it today and see what everybody thinks. Um, and we'll go, we'll, we'll talk in detail that now. So I don't want to waste any time now. Um, as far as issues goes, if you guys have time, please look at those two issues that are uh, linked here. They have to do uh, with retries and, and one of our community members uh, there makes some really good points on what we can do to improve, um, especially our retry definitions in the, in, in, in the current work was uh, specification. So having more people look at it and, and chime in, I think would really be helpful, um, especially because right now I am uh, rewriting or trying to rewrite the error handling and the timeout and the retry sections of the, of the specifications. And this has to do with that. So any input would, would be much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, any yeah, questions? If, I, if I get it, that's all by uh, our contributions by Jürgen. So thanks a lot for, um, all of the issues and the pull requests that came out of it. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, that nice discussion we had on the PRs and, and, and the issues. I have two questions on the remaining issues on retries. Uh, the both marked documentation. Could this be clarified through so documentation only or would it would we have to restrict the use of the interval versus max attempts? or the use of how we specify intervals? Um, I think there's definitely going to be changes to the, to the schema as well. So we might need to relabel those issues. Sorry. Okay. To add like spec label on it, I don't know. Wait, and um, 
yeah, I think that's for the agenda today. I didn't add any other topics. Um, so, Timmy, do you want to do the deep dive right away, or should we first conclude, ask for any other questions, do yeah, a roll call, and then jump into the deep dive? Yeah, definitely, whichever way you think is best. Okay, um, then let me ask if there are more questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would have one about the use of open API, but maybe I can take this offline uh, in favor of time. Let me do a final roll call. So Michael, hi, I noticed you joining. Thanks, yes, I'm here. And so yeah, that's it. Then let's go into our first deep dive about yeah. function definitions. Yeah, and let's see how I can share my screen. But just while I find the, uh, oh, I think you have to stop sharing, uh, Manuel. Yep. There you go. <laughs> but just to understand, uh, last uh, our last meeting, we said that uh, it would be beneficial for everybody if we if we started taking our time during these meetings and discussing certain parts of the specifications. And and honestly, I, I I'd love for this to be an open discussion. Uh, not a monologue and uh, and uh, and this one I think will be a little bit spicy I must say <laughs> so I'm hoping that everybody participates in it because it introduces a, a, a change to 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 what our specification I think we should kind of look at it and, and discuss so let me start sharing the screen and sorry my presentation is not very pretty but I started it this morning so last meeting um can you guys see my screen yep okay yes. great so last meeting we said that the first topic of the discussion uh in our kind of deep dives where we want to call these sessions is about function definitions so i just wanted to start off by saying what are function definitions in serverless workflow they're used to describe what services need to be invoked and how to invoke them they're typically external services they need to be uh, invoked during workflow execution as part of the orchestration of, of services and, and everything else that, that, that uh, you're doing and you're defining with our serverless workflow markup. And again, uh, in order to solve business problems, everything that we're doing or the defining has to solve a particular part of your business problems within your organization or, or, or the problems you're trying to solve. Uh, another thing about function definitions is that they should really provide the runtimes, all the information needed in order to invoke this particular external service. So that's kind of, I want to say that upfront. So, but there is a lot of parts about invoking services. There is authentication, callbacks, we have, especially with webhooks, and a lot of different parts, they're part of actually invoking a service or a function. So we'll get to that as well. Um, as far as our specification is concerned, since we're not doing an in-house project or a proprietary type of markup, we have to be aware about portability. So we have to understand that whatever markup we define or say users have to use if they choose to use the serverless workflow specification, uh, portability should be a very, oh, sorry about my dog, should be a very important part of, of what we're doing. So, in order to see where we're kind of taking the, uh, or where I, I, we are proposing to take this uh, function definitions, let's take a look at how this currently looks with our, our specification. And I did this little example here. This is a whole workflow definition uh, in YAML. And basically, um, uh, if you look on top after ID name and version, you'll see functions, which defines the function definition array. In serverless workflow, instead of inlining function definitions in inside of states or steps or, or, or do, uh, those parts that are really concerned with uh, execution or, or logic, uh, we actually define them up front. So we have our functions array. Each one has a name parameter, which is a unique identifier of this particular function definition. Uh, this is workflow unique identifier, not un unique identifier within the service that we're trying to evoke. This is just uh, domain specific to the workflow uh, markup itself. The second thing uh, parameter is called resource uh, and this defines the endpoint location 
of uh, this particular service that is exposed to the public. And then we have a proprietary uh, string-based uh, parameter called type, which we initially thought uh, or currently have thought when we, when we did this that it would allow runtime implementations to give further uh, information about the type of service. We kind of left it open-ended, which is a string currently type. So use, uh, users can give some more information that is again domain specific to them about this particular service. So here you, you see two uh, functions defined. One is the get current time and one is the read Wikipedia uh, function definitions. And within the states, uh, then uh, different states have actions. For example, the operation state, callback state, um, and, and event states uh, can define actions. Within actions, we can reference uh, those functions, which means referencing a function within an action means at this point, the actual uh, service should be executed during workflow uh, execution. So we have a function ref, and the second parameter down here on line 19 is ref name. And at this point, we say we reference our function uh, definition. And at this point, we want to execute the get current time function. The same thing on starting on line 20, you can see it's the same thing, but we also allow parameters, which are basically JSON objects currently uh, to, to, to be passed as the payload of, of um, uh, for the service that needs to be executed. So any questions so far? This is kind of like what we currently have. Uh, I have a question. So you've defined some of these um, parameters that I understand they're getting passed through. For example, in the Wikipedia example, but why is it that the, there isn't a definition of what parameters are available on the read Wikipedia function in this particular case? Yeah, and we're actually going to get to that, and this is a very good okay. question. Uh, one problem with, and as you will see with other uh, currently used or, or popular um, workflow markups out there, uh, you don't have that. As a workflow developer currently, you not only have to know what you want to write as far as your orchestration to solve your orchestration business problem, but you in a way have to be an admin as well to understand the API and all of the operations of all the services that you want to invoke, which definitely makes it hard for modelers, all right? So one of the parts of this that where I'm going to is kind of like a step-by-step -step approach to get to where I kind of want to get at the end. All uh, right, I'll, I'll wait for it. No, no problem. And, so this is just, again, uh, a little bit of iteration of how we currently do things. We have a name, resource, and type parameter. Function definitions also, similar to states, have a metadata definition. This is our free form type of extension object, which uh, modelers can use to add uh, uh, non-executable um, uh, parameters and information to their workflow uh, models. So yeah, metadata is also uh, available for function definitions. As far as function ref goes, again, we have a ref name, which references the name, unique name parameter on the, of the function definition. And as we have seen in the example, the parameters, which is a freeform JSON objects where you can add uh, the data that needs to be passed to the particular service that we want to invoke um, during workflow execution. Now let's, in order for us to see where we are and how to improve, uh, one of the things I think maybe it's a good idea, to, let's compare it to other ones. Now, I, I picked Google Cloud Workflow, not because I pick on Google or anything like that. It's just a new one and it's kind of new and I just wanted to see, hey, let's see what they're doing, all right? And this is for their documentation. Instead of states, they have steps and similar to, for example, AWS, which we'll see, they have, uh, they define their service execution inside of their steps where we kind of do it a little bit different and we'll be, uh, define them up front and reference them. And also can uh, reference uh, files, JSON or YAML for re reusability. We talked about this earlier, but basically uh, this is on top is kind of like the definition. They have a call parameter where you can uh, have an enumeration of different types of HTTP calls to the services that you can make. You can have arguments, uh, URL methods, you can set headers, you can set the body uh, and blah, blah, blah. Authentication information is right there as well. And then you have things like timeouts and the results as far as being the results of the service, the data uh, results, how uh, is it placed within the workflow data uh, uh, as the state execution continues. And underneath is the same example that I showed 
uh, on the earliest, earlier slide using the serverless workflow uh, specification, this is kind of like what their YAML, their, their workflows are only YAML based. Uh, this is what it looks like, basically, where we show the JSON. Uh, no, we also show the YAML, it doesn't matter. So that's kind of what it would look. As you can see, that's another approach to, to, to that's similar to ours at this point. Um, another, of course, uh, very popular workflow language out there is AWS. And I don't have a full example, I've been rushing to do this, but this is how, this is the very similar thing. They define a resource, which is, uh, in this case, an ARN, but in a way that's a, a, a URI at the end, you can look at that. And they also have um, a JSON object type called parameters where you can basically stick anything in there you wish in order um, to provide all the data, all the information for this particular service to execute. Um, so looking at these three, and of course there are many others that I haven't looked at and I hope you guys can maybe help me with looking at even different approaches, they're very similar, right? So let's see about some notes that I made. And again, this is just my opinion and you guys can tell me yours and I would love to hear it. So some notes about all of this mentioned, including ours, uh, they try to be neutral, but in a way, every single definition that we have seen so far is proprietary in the sense that it allows you to do what it allows you to do. All right, it's very specific to container or the cloud platforms you run on. For example, just letting you know from the information that I read, and if you guys work at Google or work with Google Flow, please correct me, but they allow, for example, currently at this stage, only HTTP executions to be made. Um, AWS also has the services that they have the exposed in their system, and they allow you to call those. So it's very kind of closed box type of approach where we as a specification, we kind of have to look at a much broader uh, uh, um, state at this time. So no matter what we do or no matter what we're trying or these uh, different approaches are trying to do, they were never going to fit the requirements of everybody. Now, we can't do that either. However, uh, there are always going to be changes and updates and improvements needed but they're all based on, again, the proprietary or the in-house definition of how you invoke a function. Now, the second notes I put on this slide is specific to our function definitions. Uh, I mean, what I mean by that, we're in the same boat. So we, we are also trying to invoke services during or, or define how services are evoked during um, workflow execution. But we are a specification. So we have to look at this differently. As uh, so a sophistication, we have to distinguish ourselves. We can, again, do what we're doing and keep what we're doing and refining it and updating as new customers or new consumers of the service workflow marker come in with the requirements. But again, it will be some sort of custom-based definition, right? Um, and my idea or, or, or the idea that, that, that I think us going forward should probably look at is to rely on other specifications same thing, we, our specification said that we rely for cloud event specification for cloud format. Well, functions in a way are ex executing a service is a very similar thing. We should really rely on existing specification that do things 100 times better than anything that we can specifically create and do for function or service or, uh, definitions. And at the same time, we need to focus on portability. And the more information such as authentication, username, passwords, uh, headers, things like that, that we stick in our markup itself are going to uh, limit our port portability in the future across containers and cloud platforms, or even if we're just doing this normal local host type of project, you know, that, 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 that our specification is also there for. So what does this really mean going long term for function definitions. We, I think we should start relying on open API specification. And why? For, for many reasons. Um, but let's kind of look at first where that's taking us. So services that we need, that uh, workloads uh, need to invoke during their executions have to provide or have available an open API description. And an open API is a, is a specification. It is a huge, widely used, uh, you guys can look at the docs and read everything, but their description is basically JSON or YAML format. Uh, Open API covers almost all use cases for 
invoking RESTful HTTP services, including authentication, callbacks for webhooks, et cetera, et cetera. So what they can provide and already do is already there and we don't have to duplicate it. We don't have to create a subset of it and keep improving it. It's, it's there and it's widely used. Um, it is very good for runtime implementation of our specification because a runtimes get all the information they need, all the tooling that already exists in multiple different languages uh, that they can read an OPI, open API definition and know exactly how to actually make this call. Remember also that a single call to a REST service can actually mean multiple calls, can mean getting a JWT, uh, the token, doing basic authentication, or even a lot more uh, things than that. So open API can already describe all this for us. Um, also another thing is for tooling. Now, this is where I come to your question that was asked before. Uh, with allowing OPI specifications, if there is ever tooling for serverless workload, which I hope there will be uh, outside of just the, the visual code plugin that we provide, uh, some visual tooling, for example, you will be able to uh, get uh, read the reference OPI, open API specific definition and help the users with the actual services or operations provided by the service they need to execute. So it completely offloads that part uh, from the workflow modelers uh, which I think will help a lot. Any questions so far? <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, I had connection problems in between, but oh. uh, open API. So I, I do like it probably the most for anything that is REST based because it's really complete. As you said, it, it allows everything. Um, for Amazon, web service, uh, you've given the example and they're using ARN resources. It's a URI format to describe their endpoints, but there you don't even get to choose the transport method. So whether that is HTTP or whether they are using Java RMI internally, you, you don't get to know. Um, for the, the Google example, that is a very generic uh, HTTP get. So for, um, if we stick with HTTP, um, would open API, do you happen to know if we might run into compatibility issues? Because if you, if you want to call something that you could easily call with an HTTP request and you can specify all the authentication bearer and, and whatever you need uh, in the request, um, but you don't have an API schema for it, you'd have to build it yourself, right? Yeah, and I, I thought about that a lot, actually. And the way I see it is an open API or Swagger, uh, as it's also called, has a lot of tooling already. And, and they make it very simple to build one if one doesn't exist, number one. Number two, I, I made sure that before I did this, and you guys can really really do your research yourself, and, 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 and I would love to get everybody's feedback. Everybody's doing open API now. If you look at AWS itself, they allow you to upload uh, Swagger definitions, open API definitions, and also allow you to build open API definitions from their existing services. Same thing with Google Cloud. Same thing uh, with OpenShift, for example, the stuff that I'm kind of working in, so I know that. Uh, I just talked to, for example, Scott Nichols about Knative, would that fit within the two? And he said, yes, you can also define Knative services using an open API definition. So. The, I understand that there might be use cases where users can say, hey, I don't want to do this or I cannot do this. But that is the trade-off that we're going to have to, to deal with this as a specification. Um, I, I also described in the PR that we still have the metadata section. So for users really that simply do not want to use what we, the open API, as, as I will show in the next slide, what the proposed change to the function definition, they can still use metadata to describe how to invoke their service uh, with uh, the exclamation or, or, or the note that those types of workflow definitions, we cannot as a specification ensure that they're portable across um, multiple containers or, or, or cloud environments. Um, but it's still possible to do using the metadata. Uh, okay, metadata. So we would default the type to open API I'm guessing the latest version. Yeah, you'll see sure type, is, type. type is completely removed. You'll see. Uh, next slide and then 
if you want to say, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I, I noticed, but um, okay, so anything else could use the extension mechanism to describe a different um, yeah. invocation method. Right. Yes, definitely. But uh, like we have to still understand that we cannot please everybody, no matter what we do. But however, the amount of benefits this has for the bigger yeah. public ha has to outweigh uh, if we're going to do this. So this is kind of why the discussion. No, no, I, I love it. I love it. I, I really want to make this the, the, the standard or default way for um, message invocation. The only thing I don't want to close any doors. Uh, so by removing the type field, so I was wondering if we should default it to open API or if we really want to remove it completely. We could yeah. reintroduce it later if we wanted to. Right? Definitely, definitely. So I think this is the last slide, uh, I hope. No, there is one more after this, but I did an example now. It's the same example as we saw before but with the proposed function definition where we still need a unique name. Again, the name is domain specific to the workflow definition itself as far as referencing it in actions. But you see, rather than having resource type uh, and, and anything, you have a single parameter called operation. Uh, the operation parameter is, is, is a string with two parts uh, divided by the little hashtag. The first part is a URI, so it doesn't have to be HTTP, it can be class path, file path, whatever, as, as far as, as, as long as it fits the, the URI specification, to the actual JSON or YAML file where your service, uh, open API service definition uh, is present. The part after the hashtag is the operation ID, and if you look at the uh, open API specification, there's a widely used parameter called operation ID, uh, which is do, again a domain specific parameter, which really ties in well to our uh, domain specific uh, language, workflow language itself. And uh, this is a unique mapping in the open API uh, definition uh, to a particular endpoint uh, or operation that your service provides. This is very- yeah, luckily, oh, go sorry, ahead. luckily this, the hashtag is, uh, is the, URI delimiter to specify a fragment. Yep. So date and, time and here would be a fragment. But Open API uses object references um, where the hashtag separates, uh, I think, uh, the specific path to the object, right? Um, in, in, uh, there is several. Uh, uh, f we have to identify the uniqueness in open API definition, how do we uniquely define a certain operation of the service that it provides? Uh, there is two things. You cannot use the path name itself. It's not unique mm -hmm. because you can use variables. Um, you, can, you, can, you can use name and path maybe, but one of the standards that's really across the board right now is to use the operation ID, which is uh, a string that has to be unique within the open API. It maps one-to-one -one uh, to a certain operation of the service. Um, and the same, the reason, and I'm just letting you know, we can change this format, but take a look at, for example, at Apache Camel, the latest, uh, not recently, they also added open API support and they use the same type of string. So I didn't steal it from them, but looking at their stuff, they, they, so the approach is something that other lo are looking at. That's why I think is, is, is useful, but we, we really, if we find some better approach or idea, let's use that. So that's, but we need some sort of way to define, okay, here is the YAML or JSON, which has the open API definition file. So the runtime can read it, the tooling can read it and see all the different operations that the service provides. And then we need a unique identifier, uh, which represents a single operation of that service that we actually want to invoke. So that's kind of like that. If we use this type of string format or not, I'm, or two parameters versus one, I am okay with all of that. One comment I would make is that I think the query on line 22 shouldn't be required in this case because the action in the search should come from the open API spec, right? Um, that's a good question. However, one of the things that I, uh, for example, day of the week, if you look at that, the, API, the open API specification itself does not know or is involved in the actual execution of the workflow itself. So what happens on, really after the execution of the first function, in this case, the get current time, 
the results of that function are merged with the uh, state, in this case, the get today's Wikipedia articles operation state. And then the mm -hmm. second function gets invoked, right? Uh, so we have to pass, the workflow has to pass this data, which were the results of the first function invocation as the body or the parameter to the second function uh, execution. So we still right. have that to define that. However, what OpenAPI makes it a lot easier now is that upfront during compile time, we can say, hey, uh, the, as parameters, you pass a query, right, parameter, but the OpenAPI definition says it should really be called something else. Or you're passing in one parameter, but in OpenAPI open definition of the service endpoint, uh, you require two parameters, for example. I mean, what I mean is that it, it's not necessarily a query parameter. Like it could be a post body, it could be a whatever, depending on what the, the open API spec says yeah, that it should yeah, be. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying that query maybe is not needed there because whatever, how, whatever form those parameters take should be defined as part of the open API spec. Definitely, yep. yeah. That, that's a one-to-one -one mapping that, that OpenAPI even helps us with to know exactly the structure uh, of the parameter that we have to pass in. Um, even uh, they have, uh, OpenAPI has a schema definition for the object type, so even workload developers will exactly know what the structure of the parameters needs to be in order to invoke this service. Does that help or no? All right, so do you agree that the query on line 22 is not required or do you think it is required? Um, I think you could just bump action and search up one level. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, that's fine. I agree. Yeah. Hey, hi, Tiho, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi guys, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm late. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, uh, regarding these parameters, it is, uh, this will fit very well on that PR, that issue that I opened uh, regarding we uh, giving reasonable uh, reason to the to, to parameters. So uh, if they are path parameters, query parameters, header parameters, or body parameters, we we don't know, you know, actually, uh, we, we don't need to know now because uh, with the open API thing. And yeah, I, I guess query, we, we won't need that. And maybe just uh, parameters, maybe, I don't know, name, name me and data. And then the data we, we we fetch from the from the from the variable name or from the body of the state, yeah, yeah or anything like that, because uh, we we have this context information um, coming from the Open API. And <clears throat> one other question that I have it is that uh, regarding this we uh, that you have there in the operation uh, for um, implementation, let's say that uh, they might have the the open API um, JSON file uh, within the, the, their context. Like if, uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm writing a Java implementation for that, I can, I can have that, that, that YAML or JSON file uh, within my class path. Or if I'm, running, uh, I'm writing a Go application, I can have that you know, package uh, on my binary as well. Or I can have that uh, external reference like file or anything like that. So this is a, a valid, uh, where uh, or I um, name right? So yeah, so, it's, so it can be spite HTTP. I can I can fetch this yeah. file for whatever. Class path file. It's it just has to follow URI specification. Oh yeah, yeah. just just let's try to to I don't know maybe document that and somehow or um, yeah, write that on the yeah, because maybe people will, will will ask like oh if if I can't fetch the 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 resource. Uh, my my workflow won't work, you know, because yeah. I, I won't I won't have this operation now. So yeah, we can actually have that. Yeah, I think in the PR I define it as a. In some of the examples, you even use file column forward slash forward slash rather than HTTP, just to show that you can really define where it is yourself, rather than always has to be available on some public endpoint. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I'm sorry so for last no 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 pro. So just last slide ahead, I'm sorry it takes so, so long. So here is the link to the PR. I think it's you know currently only open PR right now. Um, um, so the changes are uh, name. Uh, name is again, still the unique identifier for the function definition. Operation is now the new parameter, which we said has two parts divided by the hashtag. The first one being in URI, 
um, as, as an, 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 uh, uh, Ricardo said, and the second part being the operation ID. And on, on, on the low, I cre uh, the, uh, the image below, I created a little open API definition using the, the Swagger editor. Um, uh, that is not completely correct, but it's just the more, most important part there that shows the, how the operation ID for slash date time maps uh, to the, uh, in, in actually in our in definition of, of, of this string. Um, so yeah, and you can see, you can see uh, like you can define in OpenAPI uh, the response codes, uh, if, uh, what kind of return message it gets and the parameters and, and things like that. So yeah, it, it, it does what it does. It does what the specification is intended to do. It does it very well. So yeah, so that's all I had. If you guys have any questions, concerns, um, if you wanna know more about function definitions or anything right now, please pick up. I have a question about the um, serverless functions. Like if you go back to the AWS step functions example, where I think it was showing an ARN for a function. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, in this case, it's SNS publish. Um, if we instead have an example where the state is making a call to a Lambda function, um, how, would, how would that work? What would, you know, what would that look like with, with this? Um, we, it would look the same. The first one would be, this, uh, the operation string would be basically the first thing is again a URI to your open API uh, JSON or YAML definition. The second part would be your operation ID, for example, called publish. And you would need to either have one available or create yourself uh, an open API definition JSON or YAML uh, with a path, uh, which can be really this path right here and an operation ID of publish. So the runtime can map the operation ID to to the operate uh, uh, the operation ID to the to the one defined in your open API specification so so somebody that's running this in in AWS they would need to upload an open API spec somewhere that uh, points to their lambda function yeah but from what I've seen again this is why I kind of I do feel confident about this more than not and where I want your guys' input, because you guys might be experts in certain domains there much better than I ever could be uh, to know. But from what I read that even in, on, on AWS, you can, uh, the, uh, it can create them for you. Uh, they, them being the open API uh, definitions for the services exposed. So not in all cases, you have to do your, uh, your own and upload them somewhere, but in a lot of cases in different cloud and, 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 and providers will do this for you. Same thing on OpenShift, all the services you can, OpenShift can generate the, the open API definitions for you already. Gotcha, I think that makes sense for examples like calling SQS or calling some you know large established AWS service. Yeah. But struggling to figure out how it works with something like my own custom Lambda function that I've uploaded. Uh, and I want to invoke that. I guess, um, I guess what what it sounds like is, in that case, I I'm not sure if I'd be in, like using an open API spec for the Lambda service and then passing in the parameters that tell it to invoke my function, or if I need to provide an open API spec to describe the kind of API that that Lambda function forms. Um. Yeah, the funny thing about uh, Lambda functions, I, as far as I know, and I'm not very overly familiar with Amazon services, is um, as far as I know, in order to make a RESTful call to a Lambda function that can also expect a result, you'd have to put an API gateway in front yeah. where you yeah, choose right. the path yourself. And then you just refer to the ARN uh, as the function to be executed. And in this scenario, I'm not even sure if how the Lambda can, or how it would produce the result, but um, it's, that's the only way to make it restful. And once you have that you, for your API gateway uh, in, on Amazon, you could um, come up with a Swagger definition. 
this yep. example uses SNS publish and it's unidirectional. It's really more of a, a cloud event. It's cloud events, of course, not exactly supported uh, in Amazon, but it is the transport here is um, a message broker. So you have to publish to a topic in order to invoke the function. I think the, the Lambda here is bound to that topic ARN. Mm. And there you only have a message structure that's one way. So I don't know if, actually I assume that open API cannot define um, such APIs because it's really done for, for RESTful APIs. And those are meant to be HTTP, HTTPS based request response clients of a protocol. Um, if there is something other, and that's why I mentioned maybe we wanted to retain the type uh, for function invocations. I'm not assuming anybody wants to do old fashioned COBA calls or do some ASN1 encoding. But uh, if there are other invocation protocols not based on HTTP, um, then retaining the type field would be at least an option to extend the specification and write some proprietary extension. The other thing I have in mind is that since this is uh, unidirectional, it's not really waiting for a result. We could somehow formulate such, an, such a message as an event, a produced event that is uh, being yeah, yeah, produced by, by the workflow. We, we have, and, and that's a good thing, Manuel, you mentioned this. We have two ways of invoking functions within the serverless workflow specification. One is via the actual function definition which is meant more in our case for synchronous HTTP calls in this case. Uh, we also have the ability to invoke functions in actions via events uh, that is also already there uh, in the specification itself. So you can already uh, define in a lot of cases right now, we have functions that are not exposed via HTTP or not exposed at all, but they can be triggered via events in different containers, for example. And in that case, we can also describe a trigger event and a result event in actions uh, to invoke those types of services as well. Um, so those are more, if you want more of an async type of um, scenario where, where, where um, you fire and then you wait, you will most likely use anyways event-based uh, invocation of your services or specifically the callback state even if you wanted to. But yeah, so function is more of like a synchronous type of invocation scenario, in my opinion, again. So, so one thing on this, um, from thinking about from a user experience point of view, like in, in step functions, like this example we're looking at, I know it's SNS, but like the, the goal for when the launch step functions was to orchestrate functions, right? And I think we can look at another example where they they have like, uh, ability to trigger functions directly. So if if with our specification, um, we need some sort of a similar way to trigger functions, right? But by asking the function author to also define a YAML spec and up, have it available somewhere, uploaded somewhere, I think that's gonna increase a lot of development cost, which might not be what the function author was looking for. Definitely, yeah. and that's a, this is the type of discussion I think we definitely I wanted to have with this. There is definite trade-off, and we have to def say what we uh, want to do as a as a group. Uh, there is definitely a little bit of upfront development with this. Um, the way I looked at it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is yes, there is, but you have to understand that the actual people developing the workflow model could be completely or not understand the actual service uh, definitions that they want to invoke. I know that I want to, as a business analyst or as a user creating, solving my particular business pro problem, the orchestration of services, I know what type of service I need to invoke, but I do not need to know exactly every single operation or if, if I have to first get a JWT, if I have to do basic authentication, what is even my username and password up front? Open API is much better suited for that. So yes, you can say your requirement increases development time, but at the same time, having 
uh, open API's uh, definition even for your services will allow you to port them tomorrow to a different cloud provider, port them to a different uh, container, for example. So I don't see it as a particularly bad thing for yourself doing this work anyways. And given the open API tooling, it seriously need, takes like minimal time to do that. Uh, it's also some discovery and it's already, if you already have defined services, for example, inside the runtime container, such as Quarkus, uh, Spring Boot, things like that, it is basically just one line of, uh, of uh, in most cases, one line of um, application properties or some sort of properties that you have to set and it will generate the JSON and YAML for you. So Open API is very unique in that a lot of tooling already exists for it that will help you not have to spend a lot of, a lot of development effort. But what it buys us as a specification is, is really the fact that what would you rather have a workflow definition that is not portable or a workflow definition that is? And I think that's what we need to decide because using open API allows us as a specification to say we are indeed portable for, for service uh, definitions and, and then their invo invocations. Um, and that's the trade off that I want to, that I want to make a decision on with you guys, if possible. Can we think of like, uh, like, I don't know from a market perspective, like what the 80, 20 on this is like as a, as a workflow <laughs> developer and as a function developer uh, is like 80% of the time I'm going to require, uh, these like, uh, open API seems to me like an advanced use case, right? And I, I don't know if that's true, but it just seems to me. Like, is that something, um, do we want to force that upon everybody? Or can we think of something like uh, the current method as like a quick start uh, that can solve most of the f use cases for function invocations? Or do we think that for every use case of function invocation that we need to ask the function or the workflow developer to write an open API spec as well? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, my take, again, sorry if anybody wants to speak up, please do. But my take is, again, we are working on a specification. We're not working on an in-house project. The problem we're going to run into is uh, tomorrow, let's say, somebody wants to use the specification, but Google Ads or, or uh, anybody really out there adds a parameter that they specifically need that we can only add in the next version. And then, so they cannot use our markup that will go to Google. Same thing. Again, somebody is going to have something that we don't. And it, again, it's all proprietary and in-house definitions. Um, if it's not open API, again, the point of my talk here is let's use specification-based stuff. And we can never replicate, for example, what open API does. And if we have use cases where, uh, this is really why we use cloud events. We don't really want to <laughs> create another event format, so we said let's use the specification. Same thing with uh, function definitions, the service definitions is let's use specifications for that because that really allow us to grow uh, a lot more than, for example, markups that uh, uh, focus on in-house or proprietary definitions for this. I mean, it might be worthwhile having a, um, an inline version of the definition. To, uh, and there might be another use of this type field is to say, okay, well, yes, you know, ideally you should have an, an existing open API that you can get it from, or maybe you can host a copy of that yourself if, if one's not available. But yeah, you right. might make for a nice, you know, compact example if, if we had an inline yeah. format as well that people could use. If, if, if you guys are developing a runtime where you simply say, no, we don't want to use this, uh, you can still use the metadata section of the function definition to really put in there anything you possibly want. Uh, that is fair game and you can adjust your runtime, um, which I think we're do actually going to do a, a little bit of that also within, within Red Hat and, and also, uh, and Ricardo tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, we also looking at metadata to inject further information uh, that is specific to our runtime. But just on the specification level itself, we cannot consider those types of um, workflow definitions portable, right? I mean, am I wrong? You guys tell me. I really like the open API spec and first class support for it. I guess what I'm worried about is removing the, the, 
the type field, which seems like it, it requires the use of open API spec um, for, for all functions where um, I guess I'm worried that there are use cases that there are not where, where the interaction isn't restful. And so an a open API spec being required would be confusing to users of the, okay. of the workflow definition. All right. So I think that that's two people. I think Manuel also said the same thing. So one of the things maybe to, to move towards this implementation is let's put back the type parameter, which is again, to everybody, a string that basically runtimes can put in their own identification or further description of, of the type of service they want to invoke that makes sense for their runtime. Would, would yeah. that be okay? Yeah, I agree with it, with this as well. Cause uh, <clears throat> let's say that they, they, they wish to invoke a soap service, for instance, how they do that. Yeah. Then, you know, they, they might use the WSDL. They are very old school. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense having the type parameter. Um, and we can even um, assume a default type parameter that being an open API definition, for instance, I don't know, maybe something like that. And then if you want to change, you just you know, type your own type parameter and interpret that in a way that you, that you can um, do your thing. But again, won't be portable. Because uh, we are looking for you know, portability as well, so we can you can port um, port your workflow from from one runtime to another, and uh, if you use a proprietary type, you won't be able to do that. So that that's that could be reinforced in the in the specification as well. So regarding HTTP, I think in the generic HTTP method, we ran into issues of how to encode the query parameter to a URL, the um, authorization header fields, or potentially additional headers to be sent, um, the structure of the body, right? Because the encoding of the body wasn't clear from the function call. Um, if there was some write-up, um, I don't know, I, I'm thinking about following the, the Google example. Um, we, we could have a type HTTP that would still allow a generic adaptation, right? So Ricardo, um, would you rather switch to open API completely? Uh, use the tooling to generate specs for um, function development? So I don't know. I, I know you guys work a lot in Java. Um, if uh, it's probably like back in the WSDL times, you wouldn't run the full specification. Eventually, you end up annotating your code, and you have all the specification created through tooling. So a similar thing you could do with Open API. Um, but for somebody who just steps in, and I agree here, it, it would be a really a lot of effort. Um, describing the API, open API spec first, uh, in order to be able to use any workflow engine to make some calls. So something that just generically calls an HTTP endpoint um, makes still sense to me. Uh, I know a lot of people who still implement services uh, that way because they want to type up something quick. Um, so if we had to type HTTP and probably with some predefined metadata on the method, headers, um, body, and whatever is still in, is, is like in the Google example. Um, would you support it to add it to the specification or is that a no-go because uh, there is not enough validation in it? Mm, this is hard to, <laughs> to answer. Uh, well, from from our runtime implementation perspective, I'd say that uh, doesn't matter uh, if it is came, come from an open API or um, directly from the spec. You know, the code base would be the same. Uh, but I have mixed feelings about this because uh, you know, on, a, on we we can we can have that uh, using the only the open API and then uh, leave. Uh, every 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 standard of defining how to call an HTTP RESTful service to the Open API, and that's it, because this is the standard today. Everyone's doing that. There's a lot of tooling, like uh, Jiho said, um, to work with Swagger, for instance. You can, you know, any Java application can you can generate that, you know, 
quite 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 quick and for go as well it is basically the same thing um but at the same time, I understand that we understand that we can we can have uh, lots of um, people, you know, seeking for uh, the, the, the 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 specification just to call a simple service, and, and they do, do not have the the open API um, defined. And for that, I'd say that they they should use their own metadata and do their stuff in that, and you know, the, the, the runtime just supposed to to support that because will be a hell to maintain the specification in order to align with the open API maybe. So uh, like the, the issue that I opened to classify the parameters when calling a, a, a HTTP service, being a REST or not, um, we, we are basically doing the same job that the open API is doing. So uh, in my opinion, it should be a no-go. Uh, I'd say that uh, we should only have the type open API defined by default. And this is, uh, if you do not uh, define a type, this will be, will be open API because it is wide used, used by everyone in the industry. And, you know, and uh, we can rely on the standards of the open API and this and for REST. And for, uh, for REST, for you know, call this kind of services and uh, for ATP, uh, I'd say that the, the implementation should decide uh, how to, if they would support that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to still learn a okay. bit more about Open API. Thanks. Um, I, yeah, I, I had one question uh, still because uh, to me, you mentioned once or twice that uh, authorization is uh, Open API would give us a also give us a specification of how to authenticate with the service. Um, and I was thinking about some <laughs> messy proprietary authentication uh, methods that I've come across and how they would be supported uh, or if they could be supported generating an open API spec. So I get a definition. So um, how, how versatile is it to have, um, let's say, random uh, headers added to the request? Um, the the actual headers, you can define them all in your open okay. API thing. So again, that would offload that for us as well. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you can use metadata. I think metadata in a way, because it's not uh, really, ex it provides execution semantics. Um, you, can, you can add all the headers, extra headers you want. And again, you have to be kind of cautious, is this portable? Now, in 99% of the cases I understand for everybody, probably even here, portability is not uh, really a big issue. <laughs> you, again, you look at more work created by this rather than not. But we, ha we have to understand, again, we're working on a, on a specification itself. And one of the most important things that we're trying to distinguish ourselves from, from, from all the other workflow markups out there is this portability issue and vendor neutrality. And that, that I think that for us has to be kind of like embedded in, a, in and I, I have a hard time with that as well, um, to kind of look at this from that perspective more and more than anything else. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I fully understand that doing this uh, might limit the users actually of what, what you're doing because like you guys all said, it might be much faster and easier just to hardcore than HTTP URL in there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, then you run into the same problems uh, that we're trying to solve as a specification, right? So, so that's that's one thing. Like, why? why uh, it doesn't uh, prevent all sort of users in the event definitions to 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 use the proprietary event formatting, right? On the on the runtime either, but we recommend using the cloud event format as well. So, so that I think distinguishes us from 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 other uh, workflow markups out there. They're popping up every week, it seems, uh, and and I think that's a positive. But yeah, um, uh, I'm all a fan. I'm I'm really a fan of Open API. I just haven't. Yeah, and if there is to, a better to learn about it in detail. Uh, if there is the the reason we picked it is because, like Zan uh, Ricardo said, it is a standard out there. Um, if there is uh, other ones for, 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 for non HTTP based, let's use that. But one of the things I think that's important for us to be specification based, right? And, and yep. let's just pick the best one uh, that I think- No, will, sure, I, will, I brought yeah. it up several times. Uh, the only thing I wasn't sure about if it's uh, 
fully covers the features of a generic HTTP request. So yeah, the security information and so on that would also go into the parameters then. Yeah, you also you also solves the for example the cases that we 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 discussed with Argo recently about webhooks. It also deals with callbacks as well. So there's a lot of use cases that we really don't have to specify on our, uh, on our own and have to work with in order to to make uh, users happy. So in a way, it creates more works, which it, more, more work for our users, uh, which might limit the adoption. But the same way, I think the inclusion of 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 on runtimes and users, uh, especially the people writing the runtimes, I think this is a huge step up for them. I kind of wonder, I know we're a bit of going a bit over time now, the, um, the example that you gave before about the um, Wikipedia API, you know, you've got to pass this, um, I think it's open search action parameter every time. The way that we previously described that, you'd have to put that inside every function, every indication definition. It may make sense to have some kind of a, like a mapping on top of the open API to say, well, I'm not, I'm not just calling you know, generic Wikipedia API and, you know, passing through my parameters, but saying, okay, well, for this function definition, I always want to do the search. And then you've only got one parameter that people will then pass to that function. If you're following me. That's yeah. a nice thought, yeah, yeah. To, to have um, pre-customized uh, function calls, yeah. Yep. Pre-filled headers or pre Yeah, because in parameters. certain cases, you wouldn't want to have to repeat that everywhere. Hey, open up an issue for that. I would love to, 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 to work with you guys on that as well. All right. So if I, I mean, what did you guys think overall? Because this is our kind of like first deep dive, but it's a pretty hard one because we introduced a big change in the next ones. The way I think it was, was intended just to talk about what we have, I think, uh, two things, if, if you guys don't mind, either in chat or this week or in the next two weeks in our um, in our, uh, our team chat, if you don't mind, like writing, what would you like to see discussed next? Um, so let's pick a topic for, for our next deep dive uh, or anything else you want to talk about. Also, the same thing is like if any of you guys would be willing uh, to lead this type of discussion for next time, uh, please step up. <laughs> I, I, it would be really nice if I wasn't always the one talking about this stuff. Uh, of course I can if you guys want me to, but if anybody of you would like to take a section of the specification and talk about it to everybody um, and, and, and have a discussion, that would be great too. So, yeah. Hey, thanks to you, Mia, for leading the discussion today. I was, sorry, Kay? I don't know, I was about to say the same thing. This was really useful. Thank you. We should, yeah, we should be doing more of these deep dives. Yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Uh, I, I left some mess, uh, some comments in the PR about the, the this function definition where you, if you open API so we can, uh, I, I believe, talk in there in the PR itself. Because um, we are on top of the hour. I don't know if we have any more time to discuss anything. Great. Thank you guys so much for your comments and your time uh, to join and listen to all this. And yeah, hope to see you guys again next time. Thank right. you, Chihos. Cheers. Yeah, thanks. I really guys. enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Bye.